ที่คุณหมอทุกท่านให้ความสนใจมางานนี้ค่ะดิฉันชื่อแจ็คก,กี้นะคะวันนี้จะเป็นมอเตอร์เรเตอร์สำหรับงานค่ะก็งานนี้นะคะจัดโดยบริษัท Biomed Diagnostics Thailand ในในฐานะดิสติบิวเตอร์ของผลิตภัณฑ์โครโมโซมไมโครเรย์ร่วมด้วยกับบริษัท t h e r m o f i s h e r Scientific เจ้าของผลิตภัณฑ์นี้ค่ะในลำดับแรกนะคะท็อปิกแรกของเราคือท็อปิก Introduction to Molecular Karyotyping in OBGYN เราได้สปิเกอร์คือดรมิคเคิลวิชเชนนะคะเดี๋ยวจะกี้ขออนุญาตแนะนำดรวิชเชนให้ทุกท่านรู้จักหน่อยนะคะก็ดร์วิชเชนเป็นผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ผู้ผลิตภัณฑ์ Uh, in human genetics from the University of London and has been applying genomic and genetic technologies to answer complex biological problems for over 20 years. Since leaving academic research, he has managed to help start up research laboratories and in companies providing genomic R&D services to life science industry. In 2013, Dr. Richardson joined Thermo Fisher Scientific in the Iron Torrent Next Generation Sequencing Department. And in 2015, he moved to the Reproductive Health Department and has successfully helped many laboratories in Southeast Asia region to establish molecular technologies in routine practice. So please welcome Dr. Michael Richardson. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction, and thank you for having me here at this great event today. And just want to check, can everybody hear me at the back? Good? All right. I don't have to shout today, then. Let me just fire this presentation. Let me just jump back one. As was said in the introduction, I'm from Thermo Fisher Scientific and look after the reproductive health business around sort of the Asia Pacific region. Today we're really going to talk a little bit around our microarray products and how these are being used in the reproductive health business. So in terms of what we're going to speak about today, I'm going to give you a overall broad introduction to the microarray products and then the following speakers will give you more of an idea of how they're using this technology in their actual clinical practice. Okay. So at Thermo Fisher we have a very simple mission and that is basically to make the world healthier, cleaner and safer. And really what I'm talking about is how we make the world healthier. Okay. In this we mean by removing those genetic disorders from the general population, how we can help people have healthier children. So I'm going to start off this presentation just by giving you my idea about what is reproductive health. Okay? And basically, this is everything related to reproduction. Okay? It covers preconception, okay? carrier screening. You may have family history, or you may be a close relative, some consanguinous marriage. So you may want to go through some sort of preconception screening before you start your family. Okay. You may want to go through IVF. You may be getting older in life, or you know, for whatever other reason, some fertility issues. You may want to go through an IVF program, and in that you can use pre-implantation genetics to help you select those embryos to give you the best chance of successful pregnancies. We also use this technology in prenatal. Okay? So a lot of this would be non-invasive prenatal testing and invasive prenatal testing where we're using those chromosomal microarrays. And that's more of what we're going to talk about in detail today. But also in postnatal, so after you've had a children, after you've had a child, if there's any abnormality, you may want to understand what is the cause of that abnormality, or what is the cause of that defect. And we consider postnatal to be part of reproductive health because it basically can influence your future reproductive decisions. If you've already had one child that's had a genetic defect, then you may want to go through carrier screening or pre-implantation genetics for future children. And at Thermo Fisher, we have a product range that covers the whole spectrum of reproductive health. 
from carrier screening or family planning, we have microarray technologies. If we're doing pre-implantation genetic screening, this is something that we would do with our next generation sequencing technology. You then come on to your prenatal testing. This could be either non-invasive prenatal testing and our next generation sequencing platforms are being used widely to utilize or uh, being utilized in that application. And then we have our microarrays for invasive prenatal testing. Then postnatal, we're looking at trying to identify any genetic abnormalities that you may suspect are present. And again, we would use that with our Cytoscan microarray product range. And then something has gone wrong with my last picture on here. But we have some targeted resequencing technologies that we can use in inherited diseases to try and identify specific mutations that may be causing one of those abnormalities. So what are chromosomal microarrays or chromosomal microarray analysis? And this is basically a molecular method to analyze all 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay? So with that one single test, we can detect those genetic abnormalities across the whole genome, across all 23 pairs of chromosomes. And if we're looking at it in prenatal, this is invasive prenatal testing, looking for those abnormalities related to um, that you may have found by other methods, by your ultrasound, or by having abnormal uh, biochemical markers. Okay. It could also be found from NIPT, from non-invasive prenatal testing. So if you've got a positive non-invasive prenatal test, then you should follow that up with an invasive test and a chromosomal microarray. If we're looking at postnatal, then here we're looking at a lot of research on chromosomal abnormalities related to sort of developmental delay, intellectual disability, or autism. Now, I'm sure this is something that a lot of you are much more familiar with than I am, but this is sort of the traditional way that laboratories will do their carrier typing or study chromosomes coming from these prenatal samples. Okay. The first method of carrier typing has been around for many, many years. Okay. And then we've also got FISH. When FISH, we're looking more for detecting specific abnormalities. Okay. But both of these technologies have a certain amount of limitations. Okay. With standard carrier typing, it's got a very low diagnostic yield. You will only find mutations in about 3% of the cases that you're actually looking at. And this is mainly because it misses a lot of small abnormalities, those small losses and small gains. Okay. It's below the resolution of standard carrier typing. You generally have to do some form of cell culture, so it takes time to get results. Personally, I find it very technically challenging to do carrier typing. You know, growing the cells, trying to get them at the right stage, trying to make a nice spread on a chromosome slide was something that personally I was absolutely hopeless at. I'm sure you're all much better at it than I was. Okay. But I also find that it's very subjective. Two people can look at the same chromosome spread and maybe interpret those results slightly differently. Okay. If we're looking at fish, Again, with fish, you have to have some sort of prior knowledge of what you're looking for. You can't just randomly select a probe. You have to have an idea of what may be causing an abnormality. So you need to know exactly what you're looking for. The resolution of fish, again, is around 800 to 1 megabase. So again, certain small abnormalities you will actually miss with your fish methodology. You can only look at a certain number of targets. You can't look at all 23 pairs of chromosomes. You can't look at multiple targets across the whole genome. Okay. And as we're all well aware, we're finding out more and more of these abnormalities. These number of regions are growing. So again, we're limited by the number of targets we can use for a fish. So if the Cytoscan product range with our chromosomal microarrays. At Thermo Fisher, we have three different arrays that are being used in these uh, prenatal, postnatal applications. The first one we have is one that we call our Cytoscan Optima. This is one of our lowest density arrays. It has just around 315,000 probes on it. Okay. It's there to detect these larger aberrations. We can look at losses and gains between one to two megabases. Okay. This array is being put together and is widely used across the globe for products of conception. So trying to understand why there was a miscarriage, what was the cause of that miscarriage. And this array 
contains a higher density of probes in 396 genes that with discussion with other cytogeneticists around the world have been shown to have a high incidence in causing miscarriage. So within those 396 genes, the level of resolution is down to about 100 kb. Okay. With our Cytoscan 750k array, as the name suggests, this has 750,000 probes. Okay. This gives us a much higher genome-wide level of resolution than we get with our Cytoscan Optima. This array is mainly used in the invasive prenatal testing, so on your amnio or your CVS type samples. Okay. And then we have a much higher density array, our Cytoscan HD, which is used in postnatal research. This has 2.6 million probes on there. Okay. So again, gives us a very high level of resolution, which is the gold standard in postnatal applications. Now, our Cytoscan arrays don't just have copy number probes on them. We combine both copy number probes and SNP probes. And it's very important to have SNP probes on the array because this gives us a lot of different advantages in that we can look at detecting absence of heterozygosity, okay, loss of heterozygosity. If you're looking at products of conception, you may have maternal cell contamination. And because we have SNPs, you're able to detect whether or not you've got a pure fetal population. Okay? It helps us look at mosaicism. And again, this is something that could be very important and allows us to look at triploidy. Okay? And other issues, we have many, many SNPs on these arrays, so it gives us very accurate breakpoint detection levels. And we can look at allelic imbalance events as well. Okay, so this is just a quick summary of the three arrays that we have. Okay, I mentioned here our Cytoscan HD array. This gives us a resolution down to between 10 to 25 KB. Okay. If we're looking at absence of heterozygosity, this goes to about 1 megabase. And mosaicism, if it's above 15%, then we should be able to pick it up. The 750K array, again, slightly lower level of resolution, but around about 400 KB for losses and gains. And again, absence of heterozygosity, just around 5 megabases. And then if we look at our lower end array, the Cytoscan Optima, at least it gives us resolution around about 1 to 2 megabases for gains and losses. Again, absence of heterozygosity has to be greater than 5 megabases to be picked up. And what I mentioned there was those 396 genes where we have a much higher level of probe density. That gives us resolution in those specific genes of around about 100 KB. The workflow itself is very simple. I'm not going to go into detail of the whole workflow. We're just really looking at sample preparation. We then process the microarrays on our microarray system. Here we have a hybridization oven, a washing station, and a scanner. So a lot of this process, once we've done the preparation of samples, a lot is more automated. We then go through to our very powerful suite of data analysis tools, which gives us a very good, accurate interpretation of that data, allowing us to pick up those copy neutral losses and gains, uh, loss of heterozygosity, mosaicism, parent of origin, as well as your losses and gains that you may be uh, looking at. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that from the two following speakers. So just looking at some of the guidelines of why you should be using chromosomal microarray in your clinical studies. And this is the ACOG recommendations, which were published a few years ago now. And here they're talking about offering the invasive prenatal diagnosis if you've got identification via ultrasound, your biochemical markers, or your NIPT is positive. Okay. And looking at some of their... Uh, guidelines. Here we're saying that prenatal array testing is likely to be used as confirmation of NIPT. Okay? So this is really following those guidelines. They're suggesting that you should be using chromosomal microarray analysis as confirmation of any of those results that you find from your other methodologies. So why are we going to use it for confirmation of, let's say, a positive NIPT? So here is just one example that I've pulled out of uh, literature, and this was presented at ACMG a few years ago now. Okay. But with your NIPT, there could be some complex rearrangements that are very cryptic, you know, or very difficult to identify with other methodologies. And you also may miss some of those micro deletions. 
So this was a particular patient who was a 27-year-old. They had an NI, a positive NIPT that gave them a high risk for trisomy 13 and a risk for Cri du Chat syndrome. Now, both of these are fairly rare in a 27-year-old, so both together are very, very rare. So it was looking at, you know, is this a real event or is it just like a false positive? So they took this and took a sample and went to do some fish. So they took probes mapping to 13Q14 and also probes that mapped to the Cri du Chat region. And with fish, there was no evidence of that trisomy 13 and there was no evidence of any loss in the chromosome 5 probes. Okay. So when we took this same sample and did a microarray analysis, we found a 15.4 megabase uh, loss on chromosome 5, which overlaps with the Cri du Chat region. And we also found a 44 megabase gain on chromosome 13. And the reason fish didn't pick these up is the probes were actually designed to regions outside of where the abnormality was occurring. So this is a good example of how you can use chromosomal microarray to confirm findings that you may not pick up if you're using other technologies like fish or standard carrier typing. Why should we use... Uh, chromosomal microarrays to analyze products of conception. So again, this is another publication that was put out in 2014. And here, they were comparing just sort of routine methodologies with chromosomal microarray. And in this particular study, out of their tissue culture of their POC samples that they had, only 38% of them they were able to get results from after tissue culture. So tissue culture failed in more than 60% of cases. And they were only able to pick up abnormality in around 25% of those samples. With chromosomal microarray, they were able to get results from close to 90% of samples. Okay, so a much higher diagnostic yield they were going to get. And they're also able to detect a much higher rate of abnormalities in those particular samples. So just looking at comments that are coming out of that publication is that really that chromosomal microarray overcomes many of the limitations that you get with your conventional cytogenetic analysis when you're looking at products of conception. It reduces turnaround time because we don't have to do cell culture. And we're also able to pick up detection of submicroscopic deletions that you won't pick up with standard routine carrier typing. So just summarizing that, as again, if we're looking at those prenatal samples, we don't need to do any cell culture. Chromosomal microarrays are based on DNA, so we don't need cell culture. We minimize any cell culture failure. Okay? Because we have SNPs on the arrays, we can detect maternal cell contamination. And if you've got archive samples that you want to go back and do some research on, the methodology can be used on some of those archived FFPE type materials. No cell culture means faster time to results. Okay. And then we get increased diagnostic yield. Okay. Because we have both a combination of copy number probes and SNP probes, we're able to pick up many other types of abnormalities that you won't pick up with routine standard carrier typing. Okay. So our chromosomal microarrays really increase the chance of you actually being able to give a diagnostic. I'm going to talk briefly about postnatal and how our arrays have been used in postnatal. I'm sorry, I don't have data for Thailand, and most of the data I have here is US-based. But if we look in the US, around about 13 to 14% of children have some sort of developmental disability. And this level is growing at quite a high rate, 17% growth in children with developmental delay in the US. And most of these children are not diagnosed until after their age, after the age of four. So people are not doing any testing. You know, I guess there's the thing, you know, my child is just a slow learner. Oh, he'll grow out of that. Or, you know, we just don't like to think that our children may have some sort of disability. Okay. So early intervention, if we can do early screening, this really allows us to intervene and get the child the best possible care and help them um, with support, with education, whatever it takes to give that child a normal uh, or a better um, education and help them through their schooling years. Yeah. 
And what we see, again, there's another publication here. This was done in some Korean patients, you know, but that's just put there to really show you that chromosomal microarrays are being adopted around the globe as a first tier test for developmental delay. Okay? And in this particular study, we had a very high diagnostic yield around 15.5% for pathogenic chromosomal uh, sort of copy number variants and around about 13% for some of those variants of unknown significance. Okay? So again, we get a very high diagnostic yield compared to other technologies. Some people get a little bit worried about looking at data or interpreting data. So this is a little bit of what data looks like after you've got a chromosomal microarray. This is just an example of where we've got a copy number of one, a normal copy number two, and a copy number three, so we've got a gain all, excuse me, all on chromosome four. And this is a 46 megabase gain. You can see this here, this blue bar indicates that we've got a copy number gain. And again, here we have a log two ratio around the zero level, that's the normal. And then we've got a shift away. This is our copy number gain. And then we've got a shift below. This is our copy number loss. Okay. Because we have SNPs, we get that confirmation as well with SNPs. Because here, if we've got two chromosomes, we can have three combination of SNPs. If we have a four, if we have a third chromosome, we have four combination of SNPs. And if we only have one chromosome, we can only have two combination of SNPs. So having these SNPs gives us a confirmation of the copy number, okay, as well as allows us to detect any of those other abnormalities like uh, UPD or loss of heterozygosity. So here is a, an example of a developmental delay case, and this was published um, a couple of years ago by, uh, I can't pronounce his name, Foot, and in this case, this was a young female, two years of age, developmental delay, had a normal carrier type. When it was run by chromosomal microarray, there was a 415 KB deletion on chromosome 5. And this was missed by the routine carrier typing because it's too small for you to pick up with your microscopic uh, methodologies of routine carrier typing. In a second example, this was a seven-year-old female, and again, carrier type was normal. But when we ran on chromosomal microarray, we found that there was an eight megabase um, deletion on chromosome X. Okay? So then this child had more features related to Turner's syndrome. So again, this is something that was missed with the standard carrier typing. So I'm just going to summarize now before I hand over to some of the uh, uh, esteemed colleagues who will take you through a little bit more than I've been able to do. But with our chromosomal microarrays, what we're actually enabling you to do is get a much higher level of resolution. Okay? And it is the best option that you have for detecting your micro deletions, your micro duplications. We give you more information per test. Okay? You're not just picking up copy numbers, you're looking at loss of heterozygosity, so you're getting an increased diagnostic yield. Okay? It's a much simpler method than either standard carrier typing or FISH. We don't have to cell culture, you only need basic molecular biology. It's very simple to perform the test. Because the software is making the calls for you, you can look at it. Two, three, four, five people can look at the same data set and they will interpret it the same way. It removes any subjectivity. Okay. Because it's DNA based, we don't require any culture. Therefore, it increases our turnaround time. So instead of doing amnio, where your turnaround time may be seven, you know, one week to two weeks, you can actually turn around those samples in a, in a couple of days. And some may disagree with me, but because of the increased diagnostic yield, the more information that you get, so you, it does become a very cost-effective test. You're not having to do multiple tests to get to the same answer. It's a single test that gives you a lot more information. So I'm going to stop there, and I think I've got time for a few questions, if you do have any, or we can wait till the end, and you can ask them when, over dinner. But I'll stop there and take any questions if there are any. If not, I'll pass the mic to my esteemed colleagues. Thank you all very much. All right, thank you, um, Dr. Michael.